Ok, sarò brevissimo perché dobbiamo cominciare lì. È, è incredibile questo perché io non so chi siete voi. Una cosa del genere non l'ho mai vista. Aspetta, eh, ci ho pensato tutta la notte. E ieri è stata una specie di shock per me e non sono riuscito a realizzare quello che stava succedendo. Eh, e questo mi porta a un punto che è fondamentale. Dobbiamo invertire, per favore, veramente invertire quello che è tradizionalmente nella mentalità, nel mindset delle persone, il, il, il ruolo, ok? Cioè il pubblico e i protagonisti. E qui è tutto invertito. Ognuno di voi deve sentirsi, eh, avete creato voi con le vostre mani questa cosa, dovete sentirvi i protagonisti critici di questa cosa e quindi veramente essere lì seduti non come il pubblico. Per favore, voi non siete il pubblico, voi siete quelli che hanno creato questa cosa, voi siete il consiglio d'amministrazione, ok? E, e noi siamo i vostri consulenti. Non nulla di più dei vostri consulenti. Detto questo, eh, io spero veramente che qui la maggioranza delle persone abbia la forza di resistere a sto massacro che facciamo in due giorni di elezioni, perché vedrete come vi arrivano nelle mani strumenti uno in fila all'altro, uno in fila all'altro, uno in fila all'altro, e eh, qua vi verranno dette cose che non solo nessuno vi direbbe in nessun altro contesto in Italia, ma non le sanno. Proprio non le sanno, quindi qua verrete a conoscere dei fatti che uh, saprete solo voi e che poi potrete usare, ripeto, come questo strumento forte che avete nelle vostre mani. E cominciamo subito. Stephanie Kelton, MMT. Grazie, buongiorno. I'm going to introduce you to the basics of modern monetary theory in four parts. Modern monetary theory is a revolutionary way to think about the way a modern capitalist economy works. The first part of the talk this morning will focus on money. It's an essential part of the argument. You have to understand the difference between what we're going to call a sovereign money and a non-sovereign money. Tomorrow, th th this afternoon, we'll focus on functional finance, another essential part of modern monetary theory. It is the key to understanding how a modern economy can achieve what has for so long been unthinkable. Full employment for all people with stable prices. Tomorrow we'll talk about the international economy and the way that the domestic economy is related to what happens in the rest of the world will question the conventional thinking about deficits and debt and will focus specifically on the future of Italy. So let's begin with the first lesson. What is money? All money exists as an IOU. It's a debt. When we say I owe you, we mean two people are involved in every monetary relationship. The I is the debtor. The you is the creditor. I owe you. IOUs are recorded in what we call the money of account. The money of account in Australia is the Australian dollar the money of account in the U.S., the U.S. dollar. The money of account in Japan, the Japanese yen. In Britain, the British pound. In Italy, 
the euro. Do you see a difference? You will by the end of this talk. The money of account is something abstract, like a meter, a kilogram, a hectare. It's not something you can touch or feel. It's representational, something that only a human could imagine. In any modern nation, the money of account is chosen by the national government. MMT emphasizes the state's power over money. This is not something new. It dates back as far as Aristotle. You can find it in Adam Smith and in the work of John Maynard Keynes. I will read a brief quote from Keynes, who said, the age of chartalist or state money was reached when the state claimed the right to declare what things should answer as money of account. Today, all civilized money is beyond the possibility of dispute. Chartalist, state money. A sovereign government defines the money of account. A sovereign government imposes taxes, fees, and other obligations to be paid to the state. A sovereign government decides what it will accept in payment to itself. And a sovereign government chooses how it will make its own payments to others. Most governments in the world today choose their own unique money of account, and they issue their own unique currency. One nation, one money, is the rule in almost every corner of the world today. U.S. dollars, bills and coins, Mexican pesos, bills and coins, British pound, notes and coins. Most governments also require that taxes be paid in a currency that the state has the exclusive power to issue. These currencies are sovereign money. As long as the state has the power to enforce its tax laws, the people will need the government's money. The currency will have value. People will work to sell things, goods and services to the government in order to get government money. Whatever the government accepts in payment to itself becomes the ultimate definitive money in the economy. It is the only way to settle a debt. You must use government money. We can imagine in any economy a hierarchy of monies. Anyone can create money, but not all money is created equal. The most acceptable money sits at the top of the pyramid. Those are the IOUs that everyone accepts and everyone must accept. Those are the IOUs that are ultimately needed to pay our debts. Those are the government's IOUs. The rest of us can go in debt, issue IOUs, but our debt is not as good as government debt. It's not as acceptable. It can't be used to pay for things. 
In the US, the hierarchy looks like this. The government's IOU, the United States dollar, sits at the top of the pyramid. It is a fiat currency. The United States government is the monopoly issuer of the US dollar. The only entity on the planet that can legally create the currency. The US government taxes in dollars. It spends in dollars. And it controls its own currency. Why is this important? What are the benefits of issuing your own currency? They are extraordinary. The government, when it issues its own currency and goes into debt in that currency, can always pay its debt, can never go broke, can never run out of money. It can afford anything that is for sale in that currency. It doesn't need to borrow its own currency. And it can set its own interest rate. It does not have to pay what markets want. It does not become a victim to speculation, to bond vigilantes. It has additional policy space. It can, it can do things for its economy and for its people that a government that does not have a sovereign currency cannot do. Think about what the hierarchy would look like under a gold standard. Many governments operated under gold or silver or both for some period of time in our nation's world history. Under a gold standard, the government promises to convert its currency into gold. In that situation, what sits at the top of the pyramid is not the state's currency, but the gold reserves. This means that the government must be careful about how much it spends. If it spends too much of its own currency, it can jeopardize the entire system because it may not be able to convert currency into gold as promised. You have to limit your spending and limit what you do with your policy. Governments operating under a gold standard do not have sovereign currency. In a similar way, a country that fixes its exchange rate to another country's currency, the way Argentina and Russia and others have done, do not issue a sovereign currency. They must be careful about how much they spend. They must defend the reserves. If you promise to convert your currency into another country's currency, you might go broke. You can run out. How do you get the other country's currency? It requires trade surpluses to earn the other country's currency. You become dependent on the rest of the world and their economic well-being to sustain your own well-being. The hierarchy in a country that operates fixed exchange rates places someone else's currency at the top. 
you also lose control of your interest rate, something it's crucial to retain control of. If a country is going to have sustainable debt and full employment, The euro is not a fixed exchange rate system, but it's not a sovereign currency either. It's an exceptional case, an unprecedented experiment, where the currency is divorced from the individual nations themselves. The euro is effectively a foreign currency to you. All 17 governments that use the euro are not issuers of the currency, but users of the currency. They lack the powers that a sovereign issuer has. Japan, the United States, the UK, Canada, Australia, these are sovereign issuers. The euro is not a sovereign currency. Governments that adopted the euro must borrow the currency. They must pay whatever the bond markets require. They can run out of money. And they lack the policy space of a sovereign issuer. If you imagine the hierarchy for a member of the Eurozone, such as Italy, you see the relationship between the government and the currency is different. Italy does not issue the currency that it uses. It is an essential point. Money matters. A sovereign government should be in control of the currency that sits at the top of its pyramid. If it gives up control of a sovereign currency, it also gives up the power to set reasonable policy in its own country. It hands over that power to the bond markets who ultimately decide how much can be spent, what can be done. Abba Lerner was an economist, a contemporary of Jean Maynard Keynes. He saw this very clearly. He said, by virtue of the power to create or destroy money by fiat and its power to take money away from people through taxation, the state is in a position to keep the rate of spending in the economy at the level required for full employment. The problem with the euro is that it cannot be created at will. The governments must go out and get euros from someone else. They've sacrificed their ability to conduct sensible economic policy in every nation, and the effects are clearer now than ever.